Welcome back to Environmental Sustainability. So as we move forward, we've we've talked about genetics and, and we've talked about evolution. So you want to keep those things in mind, the things that we learned about how uh, organisms are going to pass on their traits and ultimately they want to live long enough to pass on those traits. And if they are able to live long enough, they're going to pass on those traits and um, those we're going to see more of those traits and anyone that uh, does not have those traits that are meant for or adapted for or fit for that environment, then um, they're not going to live long enough to reproduce and we're going to see less and less of those traits and eventually we're going to see that uh, organisms and species are going to evolve and they're going to mold into whatever is most fit for the environment. So you're going to want to keep these things in mind because as we move further into more of the environmental science aspect of this, the sustainability aspect of this, um, you're going to be able to refer back to that and see that the role that that plays in biology, ecology, and the environment. So this week we, we start talking about ecology, um, talking about the study of uh, the interactions between different species and the environment as well as uh, some basic biology. So biology, ecology, environmental science, biology, it's the study of living things. So while we talked about uh, evolution and genetics and we're talking about ecology, they're all lands under this uh, idea of ecology. Now, what makes biology uh, kind of uh, different from the other sciences? That biology is very has a, a a very gray area to it. So when you when, if you ever talk to a chemist or a physicist, they'll tell you that biology is terrible. It's for the birds because it's not always concrete. There's many different factors that come into play, and it's not always black and white. So biology very different. Um, to me, that's what makes biology awesome, right? It's it's the fact that there is this gray area, and, and no pun intended, but that's how life is. So it's the study of living things, the study of life, and that's really how life is, both, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way we think of it and as well as in science. So Ecology is the branch of biology that involves the study of organisms in regards to their relationships to one another as well as the environment. And then we take it to the level to talk about environmental science. Now, environmental science isn't just about the environment, but it's more centered on the impact that humans have on the environment. So it's the study of the impact that humans have on the ecosystem and the political, the economic, and the other factors that influence the effect that people have on the earth. So, um, as much as people might think environmental science is just about uh, climate change and the environment, it really has to do with the economics that uh, play a major role in why we influence the environment as well as the politics and what can we change, what can we do to influence the environment, how can we make it better, how are we making it worse. So what is study in ecology? The, the Different ecosystems are studied to understand the relationships between organisms within specific habitats. So um, you know that obviously an urban environment is going to be very different from the tundra, which is going to be very different from a deciduous forest, which is going to be very different from a desert. So these are the different ecosystems. These are the different habitats that we look at, and we're going to see that different factors are going to play a role in each one. Obviously, uh, when we talk about the ocean, all right, there's plenty of water, and we talk about the desert, there's not enough water. So those two environments are, or ecosystems are going to be very different from one another, as well as the interrelationships that we're going to see between organisms. Um, also, we're looking at the distribution and the abundance of organisms, interactions between living things and the environment. And ecologists focus on the relationships between the living things, which we call biotic factors. So anything that we're talking about that is living, that is going to be a biotic factor. And then the non-living things, which are the abiotic factors. So sometimes you'll hear about um, biotic factors, abiotic factors. Don't get tripped up by this vocabulary, by this language. It just means living and non-living things. So there's a hierarchy of life. We talk about um, the smallest level. So um, previous to something being a cell, you're going to have um, something be, uh, you know, uh, an, an atom, and then atoms are going to form these molecules, and molecules are going to form compounds, and eventually you get to this point where uh, all these compounds come together, they're going to form organelles, and when we have different organelles, they're going to make up our cells. And at this point, we consider it living. So before, if we just had an, an organelle in space that wouldn't 
make something living. All right, if we just had a molecule or something like that, that's not living. But once we have a single cell, that's where life begins. That's where we start to consider something to be living. So all living things are made of cells. If something is not made of cells, then we don't consider it living. And that's where we can draw a line between is it living or is it non-living. So cells are going to make up tissues. Tissues make up organs. Organs make up organ systems. And organ systems are going to make up the organism. And then when we when we have different organisms coming together, different species that's going uh, to make a population, okay, one uh, type of species it, uh, comes together, that's going to be a population. So when we talk about populations, okay, it's just one species, all right, more than one of them all together. That's a population. All these penguins are a population. If we had a group of lions or a pride of lions, that would be a population. Then when we start putting the different populations together, say you have the, the penguins and the seals and the walrus, those are going to create a community. And then the community is going to come together. And uh, once we have that community within a specific environment, um, this gives you the the example of organisms with the sun and the snow, you know, the the communities along with the environment, we are going to call that an ecosystem. And the ecosystems are going to come together and create this biome, which is, um, a, you know, a, a large area with many different ecosystems. And then all of our biomes together create our biosphere. So when you think about the Earth, that is a biosphere. We have species, which are a group of individuals that share certain characteristics. Okay, so a cat and a dog, two different species, all right? A, a dog and another dog, they're part of the same species. These individuals are distinct from other groups and species. Typically, we think of them as things that are able to mate. They're able to breed together. If they're not able to breed, then we don't think of them as being the same species. All species are grouped into uh, a, two genera, which are then grouped into uh, families, families grouped into orders, then orders grouped into classes, phyla, kingdoms, and do domains. So in that order, with domains being the largest. So within the domain, you will have kingdoms, and within the kingdoms, you have phyla. Within the phyla, you have classes. Species have common names, so as, as much as uh, you we, we like to use the common names, you're going to say, um, you know, a, a human but we typically um, are going to also in science want to know what the official Latin name is or the proper scientific name is. And that there's a specific naming system to that, which is going to base, be based on the species and the genera or the genus. Okay, so the Latin name is based on the genus and the species that the individual belongs to. It's always written in italics with only the first letter of the genus capitalized. So humans, if we were to look at the groups that they were put into, the domain is Eukarya, the kingdom is Animalia, the phyla is Chordata, the class is Mammalia, the order is Primates, the family is Hominidae, the genus is Homo, and the species is Sapiens. So we know all of these, okay, because Homo is going to be part of this and this is going to be part of this. So we know all that. So all we really need to use in order to know the rest is the genus and the species. That is specific enough for us to understand the rest. So we use that as their Latin name, as their proper scientific name. So um, the common name. Is humans. All right, present day humans, but the scientific name is Homo sapiens. Notice that it's in italics and only this first letter of the genus is, is uppercase um, or capitalized, where the first letter of the species is not. So Homo sapiens is part of the Homo gene, gene, genus and the uh, sapiens species. All members of a species can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Members of different species generally do not breed. Uh, new species arise due to evolution. When scientists observe new species or realize a new species has arisen, then they will create a new name for them. So over time, we see that if we were to se separate uh, a species into two different areas, 
um, one would start to evolve to be more adept to the one area and the other would evolve to be more adept to the next area and over a long period of time we're talking hundreds of thousands of years we see that they separate and they're completely different uh, species so then we have to name them um, organisms are, are found all, all the time that we never knew existed and then scientists have to put them into a genus and species and and give them a proper Latin name, and then we, of course, come up with a common name for them as well. So populations, that's all the individuals that make up an interbreeding, reproducing group. So it's one single species, but it's all the individuals of those species in a group. So only those individuals or species are in an area. So we could talk about um, the gray wolves in uh, Yellowstone National Park. That would be a population of wolves. It's not one single wolf but it's a population of gray wolves in a specific area. So a species would be all-inclusive, meaning all the gray wolves in the world. All right, we, when we talk about a, a species, it could be all the gray wolves that, are, that have the same genetic code, that are exactly the same um, genetically. But when we talk about a population, we're talking about a group of them in a specific location, in a specific habitat or area. A biotic community is the grouping of the different po populations in an area. So these the living things in a community or the community that, that is made up of the living things that's grouping all those populations together where we talked about the penguin and the seal and the walrus that is a community all vegetation animals microscopic organisms it is determined by abiotic factors all right non-living chemical and physical factors uh, which you know may include water climate salinity and soil a community is usually named for its plants they are the most obvious members Okay, the plants are, you know, really what what matter most in the community as far as when we're going to name it and think about how uh, how this um, this community is, is made up. Um, vegetation indicates the environmental conditions, and remember, the environment is going to influence which species are going to be able to survive there and stay there. Species in a community depend on each other. Okay, so they, you know, as much as we're thinking about them as being separate separate species, they do rely on each other. You know, one's going to eat the other one, and the next one's going to eat the next one, and they rely on the water source, and they rely on these different resources. So they do have these interrelationships. Populations of different species within a biotic community constantly interact um, with each other and with the non-living things in the environment, the abiotic factors, the abiotic environment. Communities have predictable predictable vegetation. So if you think about the desert, you know that there's not going to be a 100-foot sequoia in the desert. There's going to be cacti and maybe um, you know smaller shrubs, but um, nothing that's going to need too much water. So we can predict based on uh, how much rainfall there is what kind of community is going to be there. So vegetation de defines the habitat, which will influence the species that live in that environment. When we think about ecosystems, we're, talk, we're thinking about the communities um, in specific environments. But ultimately, you can't separate these. It's not completely sterile from one to the next or not completely separate. So we do have these areas of overlapping that we call ecotones or ecotones. And these ecotones are, are the overlapping where we see one ecosystem colliding with the next ecosystem. There's not like a wall between one ecosystem and the next ecosystem. There is this area of, e of overlap, which we call ecotones. So in this example, they show you a deciduous, for deciduous forest, and they show you grassland, all right? But in between this area where um, there's some overlap, where you're going to see uh, some species from each one, we're going to call this an ecotone. And this shows you a terrestrial area and an aquatic area, ecosystem one, ecosystem two, and it overlaps in this land and water ecotone. Environmental factors are going to affect the organisms. The environmental factors or the environment is going to shape which organisms can be there and how well the organisms do in that area. So um, some vocab that you want to know, you want to know that li uh, limiting factor. Limiting factor is any factor that limits the growth. So in a desert, water is going to be the limiting factor. That's what's deciding what is going to live there, what's going to thrive there. It may be a problem of too much or in, in some time, and a lot of times it's uh, too little. Law of limiting factors, any factor outside the optimal range will cause stress limit growth, reproduction, and survival of the population. So 
Um, like in the desert, the limiting factor is water, and that is what's really going to influence, um, you know, how well an organism does there, how well they're able to thrive, reproduce, and survive. Synergistic effects or synergisms, they're factors that interact to cause a greater effect than expected, like pollution may increase vulnerability to disease. So you don't necessarily think about pollution and disease going hand in hand, but they do influence each other and can have this synergistic effect. Habitat is a place where a species is adapted to live. It is defined by the plant community and the physical environment. Ecological niche, all right, that's the sum of all conditions and resources under which a species can live. What the animal eats, where it feeds and lives, and how it responds to the non-living factors, the abiotic factors. Species coexist in a habitat but have separate niches, okay? So, you know, you think of uh, different organisms that are going to live in a tree, but they might not eat the same thing from that tree, all right? Maybe you have a woodpecker that is is there to eat. Um, the worms in the tree while you have uh, a squirrel which is going to eat the acorns from the oak tree. So these are, they're living in the same habitat, but they have different niches. Uh, and, it, you know, it's reducing competition by using different resources. The biosphere is made up of all the biomes. So you have your atmosphere, you have your um, your hydrosphere, you have your lithosphere, and then all the living systems are known as the biosphere. Producers make organic molecules, usable energy. So producers, plants and al algae, um, they're going to convert low potential energy raw materials, our CO2, our H2O, our nitrogen, our phosphorus. All right, that's going to uh, the, uh, high potential energy organic molecules. Chlorophyll is a big one. We need chlorophyll in plants to absorb the kinetic light energy, light energy, which powers the production of organic molecules. So we need these organic molecules so that it can filter to the organisms and they will have energy. All right, We can't make our own energy as, uh, as consumers, but these producers can. So green plants use the process of photosynthesis to turn carbon dioxide, water, and light energy. So these are what we need. We need carbon dioxide, which we have plenty of. We need water and we need light in order for our plants to create this energy. Um, so it's going to create energy in the form of sugar, and it's going to also produce oxygen. Sugar, typically we talk about it being glucose. It's going to make glucose molecules, which is going to contain this stored chemical energy where we can break bonds and use this energy. This is just a diagram that shows you we need, um, if we were to balance the equation chemically, we would see we need six CO2 molecules, we need 12 water molecules, and that's going to create our glucose molecule, which is C6H12O6, and it's, and we're, it's going to create six O2 molecules as well as six H2O molecules. So this just shows you the diagram. All right, chlorophyll in plants help uh, plant cells is going to uh, absorb kinetic energy of light using it to remove hydrogen atoms from water and the hydrogen atoms combine with the carbon atoms from CO2 to form a glucose molecule and release oxygen gas. All right, so plants are very important in they're taking CO2 from us because we exhale carbon dioxide. They're, they're taking that carbon dioxide and they're creating more oxygen. So we need plants not only to uh, help create energy for the food web and w work its way up. We also need it so that we have more oxygen. Glucose can make all other organic um, all, all organic mo molecules, provides energy to run cell activity. So we need it for energy, provides energy. And it's stored as starch in potatoes and grains, uh, as oil and seeds for future use. Each stage of these reactions uses enzymes, which are proteins that are going to help with chemical reactions, um, and they're going to promote the synthesis or breaking of chemical bonds. Cellular respiration, okay, so plants do photosynthesis, but every organism is going to use cellular respiration, or every organism that, that uses um, oxygen, that, that needs oxygen at some point for aerobic respiration, um, they need to do this in order to use this energy energy to, to make the energy available to us. So it breaks organic molecules, it's releasing potential energy for the cell to use, involves the breakdown of glucose, is it's the reverse of photosynthesis. So while it's uh, while photosynthesis is taking carbon dioxide and letting out oxygen, cellular respiration is taking in oxygen and letting out carbon dioxide. Um, 
many aquatic plants are oxygen limited. All right, so they're not able to do it as efficiently or uh, as often as, as they would like to. This just shows you a diagram of cellular respiration. So, um, you know, the, the organism, the, the deer is not going to be able to make its own energy from the sunlight. So it has to consume food. And when it consumes food, that is how it gets its glucose and it is going to breathe in oxygen. And that is cellular respiration so that we have energy. And then as waste products, we're going to have some water and some carbon dioxide. Um, it's not 100% efficient. According to the second law of thermodynamics, um, cellular respiration is only 40 to 60% efficient. And energy is also released as, weight, um, as waste as heat. Okay, so, um, you know, as much as you would think that at this point we would evolve to be more efficient, but we do waste a lot in heat. Um, consuming more calories than your body needs, we have to do that because we are wasting a lot of it. Converts calories to fat and results in weight gain. So if we're taking in too much, then we're going to get fat. Stored energy can also be released from food without oxygen. And then instead of aerobic respiration, sometimes we have anaerobic respiration, also known as fermentation, which is less efficient uh, than, than uh, aerobic respiration, but is needed when there's a lack of oxygen. So it's less efficient than oxid oxidation, but if there's no oxygen, then it's what we need to do in order for us to uh, make energy occurs in organisms living in oxygen limited areas some terms to know some vocab autotrophs so whenever we talk about plants these are autotrophs they're organisms that create their own energy typically plants um, there's also bacteria that are able to create their own energy that don't use the sun but typically when we're talking about autotrophs we're talking about plants that are going to turn sunlight into a form of energy turn sunlight into glucose for the rest of the food web. Often used interchangeably with the term producer. Okay, so autotrophs and producers, we're gonna find those they're, that they're the same thing. And then you have heterotrophs, um, which is an organism that cannot create its own energy. Okay, they're gonna use cellular respiration. Um, they're gonna have to break down molecules so that energy is usable, but they're not actually creating their own energy. Often used interchangeably with the term consumer so heterotroph consumer used interchangeably and then you have decomposers which are organisms that break down dead organic material uh, can be considered a heterotroph but we talk about them being separate in the food pyramid in the energy pyramid or the food web it's a nice diagram which is uh, just shows you the the differences between your autotrophs and your heterotrophs so under autotrophs we have producers these are our plants um, green plants photosynthetic bacteria and then also we have chemosynthetic bacteria that we don't talk about too often and then you have your heterotrophs which must eat things they must eat food they can't create their own energy you have their your consumers and your decomposers and there's various different consumers that we'll talk about as we move forward um, when you talk about food chains you know, when you're in elementary school, they always talk about food chains. You know, this thing gets energy from the next thing. This thing gets energy from the next thing. But that's kind of a juvenile way of looking at an ecosystem. In reality, we must uh, organize these into uh, groups of food chains, which we call food webs. So the better way to show an ecosystem is to look at the food webs because it's not just one thing that's eating the next thing and that one thing eats the next thing. It's this thing could eat these three things and then those three things can then eat their own three different things. So we like to organize our food webs into uh, groups and it's going to be known as a food web. So food chain shows a single route, but our food web shows the various routes that energy can flow through an ecosystem. Um, the arrows show the direction that the energy flows. So keep this in mind when you're looking at food webs. It's not saying this is eating this and this is eating this. It's actually saying that the energy from this is going to this and the energy that's in this is going to this. So the arrows go kind of the opposite way that you would think they would go. And energy moves up through the food chain. Most energy is lost going to the higher trophic levels. So keep this in mind as we talk about the reason that organisms have to consume so much and why there's less and less of organisms as we move up that energy pyramid. So this is just a basic food web. Notice again, the arrows go which way the energy goes. So a lot of times students want to say, oh, you know, the, uh, the, 
rabbit eats the grass, but that is not right. You're showing that the energy in the grass goes to the rabbit. Okay, the energy in the corn goes to the rabbit. Okay, the energy in the rabbit goes to the hawk. So notice how these these arrows are drawn. When you create your own food web or your own food chain, it's the same thing. Um, and as you see, if I were just to make one food chain, okay, it would just show grass, the energy in the grass goes to the rabbit, and the energy in the rabbit goes to the fox, and that'd be the end of it. But if you see, there's many different, several things can eat grass, and several things can eat the rabbit, and the rabbit can eat several things, and then the fox can eat several things. So there's many different uh roots that the energy can go and that's why we don't just do a food chain we like to show it in a food web there's also this is another example of of an ocean food web where we see that the energy from the sun is going to go to these diatoms and the phytoplankton and then they're going to uh, continue up the the food web and eventually get to larger organisms which are going to have a choice or am i going to eat these fish or these fish and so on and so forth. So consumers in the food web, consumers are, um, they range in size from plankton to blue whales. Okay, so anything that's going to eat a producer is going to be considered a consumer. All right, so consumers eat producers. All right, um, so and then anything that's going to eat something else is also a consumer. So uh, first level consumers are eat producers. And then anything that eats other consumers is also a consumer. So it ranges in various sizes. Um, they're categorized into their food sources. So you have first order consumers. All right. So at the bottom of, if we look at our energy pyramid, the bottom, we're always going to have our producers. And then you're going to have your first or your primary first order consumers which are going to be herbivores, they're eating the producers, then you're going to have second, and then third or tertiary, and then you're going to have your fourth or quaternary. All right, so um, first order, they're going to eat the producers. Second order, they're going to eat the primary or the first order consumers, and then you're going to work your way up from there. Some things may eat, um, you know, if you have a, a, a second order consumer they might also be a first order consumer if they eat producers and you have a, a third order or tertiary consumer they might eat things in the uh, that are second second order consumers or secondary consumers or primary consumers so they might fall into different categories depending on the different things that they eat any animals can occupy multiple levels and depends on the food that they eat um, more vocab you have carnivores versus omnivores carnivores are going to eat meat omnivores are going to eat both plants and animals so when we talk about trophic levels when we're talking about uh, energy pyramids typically shown in a pyramid but you can look at it in this sense as well they drew a nice picture where as you move up it gives you a little depth, but um, in the foreground, we see these producers. They are getting energy from the sun, so it doesn't really show you, but maybe there should be a sun that is bringing energy to these producers, to this grass. Um, and then your first order consumers are going to be eating those producers. Uh, these are these guys. And then these second order consumers are, are eating these guys. And then you have third order consumer, this hawk, which is going to eat one of these all right so you have these different levels all right ultimately you see that you know this hawk can eat one of these guys so it can be a, a second order consumer or a third order consumer but in this example they show you it, it as a third order consumer and as you move away from the producers you're losing energy so these guys might have to eat a bunch of grass but then as you move up the snake has to eat a, a lot more of uh, you know the the squirrels or the the rabbits or the mice and then the hawk has to eat a ton so we're not going to see too many hawks um we're going to see a lot more rabbits than hawks because there's a lot more energy in the grass um so decomposers have their own food web uh they they when we look at them they can fit in anywhere in that food web so we can't really draw a, a food web and show exactly where they are because they they 
fit in everywhere. And when we look at that energy pyramid, um, they're not going to just be in one level of this pyramid. They can kind of fit in anywhere. They can break down organic matter anywhere in here. So detritus is dead plant material, uh, fe fecal waste, and dead bodies, which we call carrion. And most ecosystem energy goes through this food web. Detritus is organic and high in potential energy. So, um, you know, it does fuel the decomposers and it, it's uh, able to give them energy so that they can continue to thrive. Scavengers like vultures, um, they're decomposers that break down large pieces of matter. You have detritus fe feeders like earthworms. They're de decomposers that eat partly decomposed matter. And then you have chemical decomposers like fungi, and more specifically, we talk about a lot of bacteria that are going to break down molecule, molecule, molecule sized matter. All right, this shows you a food web example where you know you have your decomposers. These guys are fitting in all over the place. You have your your bacteria, which can be anywhere. Your earthworm in the soil. You have your soil fungi. These are all breaking down that organic matter. Uh, decomposers are very important because they're going to uh, break down uh, the bonds in the organic molecules, release, releasing chemical energy into the ecosystem. They also breaks the bonds holding carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other nutrients. The release of nutrients by decomposers is very, very important to primary consumers. Uh, it's the major source of nutrients in most ecosystems. So we need these decomposers to add the nutrients to the soil so that it can go into the producers and it can work its way up that food web. Picoheterotrophs are their tiny single-celled eukaryote or eukaryotic bacteria or bacteria-like, and they're common in deep oceans. So um, as much as we talk about heterotrophs, in oceans we have these picoheterotrophs, and they have a significant impact on the nutrient recycling in deep oceans. There are limits to trophic levels. Terrestrial ecosystems have three or four trophic levels, so you're going to have that tertiary, that quaternary level. But beyond that, we're, we're not really going to see any more trophic levels in our energy pyramid. Okay, In some uh, marine systems you might see five but you know you're not, not going to see 10 11 12 it's just not going to happen there's not enough energy you lose too much energy as you work your way up that you're not going to see these levels go on forever it typically gets to you know the third the fourth maybe even the fifth and that's the end of it biomass is the total weight of organisms so about 90 percent less biomass at each higher trophic level so we see as we go up there are less and less of that that organism so when we look at the grass, there's tons of grass everywhere, okay? Then there's going to be even less of the mice that are eating the grass, and then even even less of the snakes eating the mice, and then even less of the hawks eating the, the snakes. So there is that decrease in the, the population of each species as we move up to the next level, and that's why we don't get past that fifth trophic level. In one week acre of grassland, you might have 2,000 pounds of grass, and then you see that there's only 200 pounds of herbivores, and then there's only 20 pounds of second-order consumers. So um, as we move up, there's less and less energy, and there's less and less of those organisms. A biomass pyramid, which is what I've been calling an energy pyramid, same thing, is the total biomass at successive trophic levels. This shows you, show it, so if, um, you know, just hypothetical numbers, you have 100 uh, joules of energy and as you move to the next level there's only going to be 10 and as you move to the next level there's only going to be one and then maybe you'll just have 0.1 or one tenth as you move to that next level but keep in mind each level we are also going to have decomposers So as much as we like to think of it as these are this is all the grass and these are the rabbits and these are the snakes and and these are the hawks, we have decomposers that can uh, break down the the dying grass and can break down the the dead uh, rabbits and can break down a dead snake and can break down a, a dead hawk. So decomposers fit in anywhere in this. We can't really give it a level. Energy. Most ecosystems use sunlight as their initial energy source. So if you look at uh, this diagram, okay, it doesn't show you, but there should be a sun here because that is what's starting it all. There'd be no energy in this entire ecosystem without the sun. 
Um, primary production, production of organic molecules, captures only 2% of the solar energy, um, but that's enough to fuel all of life. Standing crop biomass is the biomass of primary producers in the ecosystem at any given time. Not always a good measure of productivity, though. The fate of food, 60 to 90% of food consumed is oxidized for energy. 10 to 40% is converted to body tissues for growth, repair, and maintenance. And undigested food is excreted. Cellulose. Okay, this is material in plant cell walls, which is excreted by herbivores um, because we're not able to uh, break it down. So it referred to as fiber, bulk, or roughage, and is a necessary part of the diet. Um, carbon, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, phosphorus, and water are also excreted in your urine. And lastly, um, when you are looking at the lab this week, you're going to see that we're talking about uh, trophic cascades. Trophic cascades might throw you off when we're talking about food webs because while food webs deal with the direct effects of interactions with species, trophic cascades examine the indirect effects that may not always be obvious and um, ultimately the arrows in these go the opposite way. So it in, in these it's showing you that the uh, predator has an effect on the herbivores and the herbivores have an effect on the vegetation and um, so that might throw you off because when we're looking at uh, energy, when we're looking at the flow of energy in a food web, the arrows are going the opposite way. So don't get tri tricked up, tripped up by that. But trophic cascades are showing you not only what's eating what, where the energy is flowing, but maybe what has a, an influence. So as much as this predator is going to eat this herbivore and have a, a direct effect on the number of herbivores there are here. And we're going to see that these herbivores are going to eat this vegetation. It's going to have a direct effect on the number of, of, uh, of plants there are. We're also going to see that, hey, if these predators are able to keep these herbivores in check, then the vegetation will do better. And Ultimately, the, these predators have a positive indirect effect on this vegetation. So keep these things in mind as we move forward and as you're working on the lab this week.